Good morning, Gardens. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Jesus is present in this place as we gather for worship through the power of the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit calls us to worship this morning. So would you join me in the call to worship that you'll see printed in your bulletin and also on the screens. The Lord be with you. Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching and proclaiming the good news. Amen and thanks be to God. It's great to see everyone this morning. Uh, we are, are privileged to have the sun out again, right? <laughs> we, uh, got a, I've got a lake in my front yard. I don't know about your front yards, but that's a lot. So it's good to see you all. It's good to see the sun. It's be good to be gathered together in Jesus' name. Special uh, welcome to all of our guests and visitors who are with us for the first time. We pray that you'd experience Christ's presence for all of us who gather together this morning. It's our collective prayer that as we encounter the presence of the risen Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, that our lives, that our hearts, that we would be changed, that we would be compelled to continue to deepen our commitment to the ways of Jesus and to live as his disciples and people who are committed to the love, the grace, and the mercy of the reign of God, and that we would be strengthened for that mission and ministry that we have simply as being called disciples of Christ together. So it's great to see you all. A few announcements just to share with you this morning. Um, the first is this is uh, Super Bowl Sunday, not just the football game that nobody cares about here, um, with two teams that we don't really care about either. One, a team who continues to defeat my Miami Dolphins, and another team who, who betrayed my, my former city of St. Louis. So, um, you know what? I just will not be watching the Super Bowl today. And I would like to encourage everyone to not watch it as well and not to support these two uh, evil empires. So, uh, I'm just kidding. Go, go. No, I'm not, I can't even say it. I can't even pretend to say go Patriots. So... Yes, but more importantly, we're collecting soup cans and other canned goods and other uh, loose change for, our, uh, for a collection for our Super Bowl of caring that our children will be helping do later in our service. And just as kind of a, a word of information, all the food and all the monies that are collected will go to um, help alleviate hunger and food insecurity here in South Florida. So it's part of what Jesus has called us to do, to feed people who are hungry. It's foundational to what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And so we're privileged to be called into that, into that work today. Now, those are all the announcements that I have to share with you. So I would invite you now to stand and to greet one another and welcome each other to worship. This day. Our first scripture lesson this morning is God's call to the prophet Jeremiah from the, Jeremiah, the first chapter, verses 4 through 10. It's on your screens, it's in your bulletins, or just listen for the word of God to you this morning. The Lord's word came to me. Before I created you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I made you a prophet to the nations. Ah, Lord God, I said, I don't know how to speak because I am only a child. The Lord responded, don't say I'm only a child. Where I send you, you must go. What I tell you, you must say. Don't be afraid of them because I'm with you to rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord stretched out his hand touched my mouth and said to me, I'm putting my words in your mouth. This very day, I appoint you over nations and empires to dig up and pull down, to destroy and demolish, to build and to plant. Our second scripture lesson from this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 4, verse 21 through 30, and we pick off where we left, we pick up where we left off last week with Jesus in the synagogue of Nazareth, having just received the scroll of Isaiah, 
unrolled it, read from it, and claimed the prophet's words about the work of the Messiah who would come to establish the reign of God through the work of establishing justice and rightness on this earth. Our passage this for scripture passage of scripture this morning continues that story in which we'll have a chance to see just exactly how Jesus' words were received. Hear now the word of the Lord. Jesus began to explain to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled just as you heard it. Everyone was raving about Jesus, so impressed were they by the gracious words flowing from his lips. They said, this is Joseph's son, isn't it? Then Jesus said to them, undoubtedly, you will quote this saying to me, doctor, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we've heard you did in Capernaum. And he said, I assure you that no prophet is welcome in the prophet's hometown. And I can assure you that there were many widows in Israel during Elijah's time, when it didn't rain for three and a half years, and there was a great food shortage in the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to a widow in the city of Zarephath, in the region of Sidon. There were also many persons with skin diseases in Israel during the time of the prophet Elisha, but none of them were cleansed. Instead, Naaman, the Syrian, was cleansed. When they heard this, everyone in the synagogue was filled with anger. They rose up and ran, out, ran him out of town. They led him to the crest of the hill on which their town had been built, so that they could throw him off the cliff. But he passed through the crowd and went on his way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord God, our Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier, in this moment and in this time of stillness, come. Fill this sanctuary with your presence. And fill our hearts with your presence. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. So last week we talked about how the implications of what, what Jesus said the meaning behind the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and what that meant for his ministry and the ministry of the people of God and in particular the ministry of those whom Jesus would call to be his disciples, that he was one who was called by God, anointed by God as the Messiah to be about the work of establishing the reign of God on earth, a place where there would be justice where all the wrongness of the world would be righted because of the grace and the mercy and the love and the justice of God. That all the things that would oppress, all the things that would marginalize, all these forces that the Apostle Paul calls the powers and principalities, these things at work in the world that would subjugate some and empower others at the expense of some, that part of Jesus' ministry, part of the proclamation of the gospel, was not only spiritual liberation, but the liberation from these unjust forces, and that Jesus and the church and the people of God would be people who would be called to stand up and stand against these injustices that would deny another person's humanity, that would obscure the image of God within them. That is who Jesus said he would be. He was reading 
his mission statement in this morning. We read that when he first proclaimed, we first preached this sermon, everybody in the crowd gathered in Nazareth, in that synagogue, who heard Jesus read from that scroll, all had the same initial response. Wow! Jesus is a good speaker! He can really put together a speech. A plus for oration, Jesus. You had my attention. I was on the edge of my seat. That was great. You have done your father, Joseph, proud. Way to go. You are a child of this community, and we are proud of you. boy, we appreciate it. But then there's a subtext, the thing that the crowd didn't say. And Jesus, being Jesus, was able to perceive their thoughts. And that's why he says this really strange thing in what seems like a non sequitur in this passage of Scripture, where immediately the crowd is initially really positive and they're proclaiming kind of praise on Jesus. And then Jesus kind of comes out with one of these things. Instead of saying, thank you, right, the thing that we teach our children to say when someone pays you a compliment, graciously accept that, Jesus instead says, undoubtedly you will quote this saying to me, Doctor, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we've heard you did in Capernaum. Okay? What does that mean? And how is that relevant, Jesus, to the things that these, this crowd was just saying about you? Well, so again, Jesus is able to perceive something that is happening kind of within the crowd, perhaps murmuring, perhaps it's just what has already been discussed in Jesus' hometown. One of the things that Luke is conveying here is that before Jesus has entered this community of Nazareth, before he has stepped into this synagogue and unrolled this passage of scroll from Isaiah, Jesus actually, and it's not recorded in the Gospel of Luke, but Jesus is actually been at work doing some ministry in Capernaum, which is the place that we will see the bulk of his ministry. And if you've come to our Bible studies on Mondays, and we've been spending the last year and a half in the Gospel of Luke, um, you know we've spent a lot of time in Capernaum, this region kind of around um, the Sea of Galilee, the northern part of Judea, where Jesus it was essentially Jesus' hometown, his kind of home um, area, his home territory of ministry. So Jesus, actually, it's not recorded in Luke, but he's already been at work with his ministry of healing, his ministry of performing some miracles. And that's been reported to the people in Nazareth. They've heard that Jesus has healed people. That Jesus' power has been on display for the people of Capernaum. And the people gathered in that synagogue in Nazareth are ready for their turn. It's all well and good that Jesus goes to the sticks, to the back country, up to Capernaum, and demonstrates Jesus is his mighty power to perform miracles and to heal people. But now Jesus has returned home. He's back in Nazareth, and now it is our turn. Now it's our turn to see Jesus' power. Now it's our turn to be blessed by Jesus' miraculous healing ministry. It's our turn to have our jaws drop as we get to see the magic that Jesus will portray in front of us, just like he did that at Capernaum. But he doesn't begin by doing that, does he? Instead, Jesus gives a sermon. (laughs) Who wants to hear a sermon when you can see healing? He gives a sermon, and not just any sermon, but a sermon about justice, and a sermon that also references a passage of scripture in the book of Leviticus, Leviticus 25, that references something called the year of Jubilee. 
And the year of Jubilee was something mentioned in the book of Leviticus. Again, Leviticus 25. It's part of the Old Testament law that God um, kind of established for God's people, Israel, and their way of living is such a life. And again, remember, the law is, was a gift, a gift of grace that God gave to his people, Israel, to God's people, Israel, as a means of both establishing a form of grace and mercy and also a prophetic witness in the world. So the law was given to Israel to instruct Israel on how to live. And if Israel lived according to that, the hope of the law was that they would live such a distinctive and a unique way of life that was so shaped by God's will and God's priorities for how Israel was to live that all the other nations would be blessed by Israel. And blessed by the mercy and the justice and the grace that was inherent in the law and inherent in the way that Israel was called. So the law for Israel was this means of both, essentially it was a means of mission and a means of blessing and grace. And it was the way that the nations would come to acknowledge Yahweh as God. And that was the promise that God made with Abraham, that covenant that God cut. Um, so there, within this Within the law is this thing called, in Leviticus 25, there's this thing called the year of Jubilee. And it was something that was supposed to, supposed to happen every 50 years. And it was this, there's no way to talk about what the year of Jubilee is without calling it absolutely radical and paradigm altering. It was a year, every 50 years, of the complete and total forgiveness of any and all earthly debt. So every 50 years, doesn't matter what kind of debt you've accrued over the course of that 50 years, all those debts are forgiven. Over those 50 years, if as a result of some of the economic uh, choices that somebody has made over the course, or injustices that have occurred over the course of those 50 years, that someone found themselves having to indenture themselves in servitude to another person, that that person, that indentured servant, was freed from those bonds. Over those 50 years, if property was acquired by one clan or one family outside of the initial distribution of property of the original 12 tribes of Israel when they settled in the land, then all, whatever kind of real estate had been claimed by some at the expense of others, all that, they just hit the reset button. So every 50 years, any kind of debt, any kind of indebted mint that occurred, was reset. It was forgiven. And the purpose of this was twofold. The purpose of it was to seek to establish a just community, a just society, an equitable society. And the second of which was so that it would be sacramental. To say, you think that this is amazing debt forgiveness. Think about the grace of God. And the way that God offers us grace in the midst of our depravity and brokenness. Jubilee was to sacramentally point to God's gracious gift of life and of freedom and of forgiveness. And because Israel was a people who was fundamentally graced by God and made free by God, they were to embody that within their community. And they were to do that every 50 years, according to Leviticus 25. Well, here's the great part, because I know what you're all thinking, right? I can see you. I know what you're thinking. Your eyes are squinting, and Jerry Adams up here especially, he's going, listen, that's just not practical. And it's not practical. But the first thing you got to know about the kingdom of God is there's nothing practical, practical about the kingdom of God. There's nothing practical about grace and forgiveness and mercy. There's nothing that's practical about it. And there's certainly nothing that seems practical about a year of Jubilee. And guess what? You're not alone. The Israelites thought the same thing. And in fact, there is evidence that though Leviticus 25 commands, instructs Israel to practice a year of Jubilee every 50 years, they never did it. <laughs> they were like, yeah, we're not going to do that. <laughs> Greed. 
claims all of our hearts, doesn't it? So Jesus preaches a sermon about being people of justice and being people of equity, being people who would stand up to the injustices of this world. And the people of Nazareth did not want to hear that sermon. They wanted to see Jesus' miracles. But they throw Jesus a bone and they say, okay, fine, fine. You know, it's not, it's not the way I would have started my time if I were you, Jesus, here in your hometown. But if you wanted to do that, that's cool. Great job. Yay. We can pat you on the back. You are a great speaker. Wonderful sermon. Amazing. Do we listen to it? Do we going to take any of that to heart? Absolutely not. Of course not. We're not going to try to apply any of that to our life. But great job. Wonderful sermon. Now, for the good stuff, okay? We sat through that ridiculous sermon about the year of Jubilee. Now do some miracles, please. That's why we're here. And Jesus says, no. I'm actually not going to do that. I know that's what you want me to do. I know that's why you have come here. And then, just because that's not enough, Jesus then kind of like just jabs it a little bit more deeply and references two Old Testament um, allusions in which God's generosity, God's grace, and God's miracles, and God's healing through the, both the prophet of Elijah and Elisha, God's miraculous power was demonstrated on people who were outside of God's covenant community. And then the people in the synagogue just kind of lost it. And they marched Jesus out of the synagogue up to a hill, at least according to the Gospel of Luke, a hill. Biblical archaeologists and scholars have looked at Nazareth, and guess what? There's no hill in Nazareth. Luke is making a point, and we'll get back to that in a second. They marches them out, and they're ready to kill Jesus. They're ready to banish him. They are so angry, and they are so annoyed with this message of Jesus and their lack of receiving the things that they want from him that they are ready to crucify. Oh, no, not crucify. They're ready to banish him. That crucifixion part will come. So why are they so angry? Why are they so upset? And why is Jesus rejected? I feel, yeah, I feel bad for Jesus, right? He's like that high school guy who just can't get the date. This is his first day in public ministry, and already he's being rejected. People are saying, no, thank you. We, got, well, we want nothing to do with you, Jesus. The first reason is because the crowd does not want Jesus' justice. They want his power. They don't care about justice, about the ways of the reign of God, about making things right in the world, but they do care about power. Power for themselves and power directed, the power of God directed at themselves. And that's the second reason that they reject Jesus, is because they do not want Jesus' ministry, attention, and power directed at others. But they want it directed at themselves. Why should others get this power, Jesus? We want it. Unleash your blessing on me. Unleash your blessing on us. Forget about them. I, I deserve it. The crowd has no interest being servants of the reign of God. Living their life in service to the things that Jesus will call disciples to give up their lives for. No interest in being servants of the reign of God. But this crowd wants and has every desire and all the interest in the world 
in being served by Jesus. And finally, the crowd rejects Jesus because they refuse to allow Jesus to define himself, to mysteriously define his ministry. And instead, want to tell Jesus what his ministry should be. Man, thank God we are so different from that synagogue in Nazareth, right? I mean, thank God we don't have that problem. Or maybe that's our fundamental problem. That we, too, are a people of God who don't want to let God speak for God's self, don't want to let Jesus define not only Jesus' mission and ministry, but ours as well. It is so much more seductive to think about Jesus as a spiritual technology for our personal use and gain and blessing. But Jesus has come not to promise that your lives will be easy or blessed or full of miracles. But Jesus has come to call you and invite you to spend your life in the service of and in the establishment of the reign of God on this earth. And the crowd in Nazareth, that synagogue, they didn't really find Jesus' words, his invitation very compelling. But I wonder, do we find it compelling? Because the one thing that Jesus offers is an invitation to lose your life. Not necessarily to be martyred. I'm not talking about earthly life. Although it may come to that, I don't know. But what Jesus offers is an invitation to let go of our egocentric, self-centered selves. Would it not be amazing to wake up one morning and to not think about ourselves? But to wake up and to think about others and their needs and the injustice that they face. That's the freedom that Jesus offers. And here's the thing, and here's the beautiful thing about it. It doesn't mean that your suffering, Jesus doesn't care about. And it doesn't mean that Jesus won't meet you in that place. But what it means is that Jesus wants to gift you with the freedom to not worry about your suffering, but to let somebody else carry it for you. And that's what it means to be the church. To wake up consumed by, fully shouldering, owning, carrying another person's suffering so they don't have to. Look around. And this room is full of people who are suffering. We are all of us suffering and hurting. Jesus' invitation 
is to carry another's suffering so that they do not have to. And in so doing, embody and establish the reign of God on earth. But here's the thing. And this gets back to the whole there's no hill in Nazareth thing. Luke's making a point. There is a hill in the gospel of Luke. There is a real hill in the gospels. And that's on a place called Golgotha. And that's where Jesus is crucified. The invitation that Jesus offers all of his disciples is to experience life by being willing to lay down your life just like he did. Let's pray. Amen. I invite you to stand now and join in singing.